Hi guys, good morning. Uh, welcome to the panel discussion and an odyssey to your next alma mater. And I'm Rajdeep Puri, the founder of Revisor and also your host for today. Uh, Revisor as a company is an educational support company uh, which has helped more than 3,000 odd students in the last five years uh, in largely two main verticals. The first one is the test prep wherein we cater to SATs, ACTs, and AP, which are advanced placement courses. And we will talk about a little bit more about the advanced placement courses. And then the other vertical, which is in the academic tutoring space for IGCC, IB, and A levels. Uh, that's in short what we do. Uh, but today we all are here to provide you a glimpse of how these two brilliant students were able to sail through their journey from high school to 10, 12, and now finally are ready to go to the college. So we, we are going to discuss with them the obstacles that they have faced, uh, anything that they would like to change if they had a chance to go back and look upon, and, and also to share their learnings from the past experience, right? Uh, with that, uh, let me open the discussion forum. Uh, let me quickly introduce uh, you guys with regards to how the format is going to be. So we, we are going to do a, like a round robin question Q&A sessions among each other. With, between the three of us. And uh, we will be taking about eight to 10 questions, which is for roughly about 40 odd minutes. And post that we will open the mic for Q&A. If in case anybody in the audience have any question, uh, feel free to put it on the chat section. We will try and take it up now uh, in between via just the messages. If not, at the end, we are gonna take those questions directly. Right now, you guys might be on mute and may not have the option to unmute yourself. Uh, and towards the end, I'll probably open that as well. Uh, with that, let's, if in case the speakers are ready, shall we start then? Sure. Perfect. Great. Uh, okay, let me start. Uh, can you guys go ahead and probably start with the introduction? Uh, over to you, Advait. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Advait Ravi Shankar, um, and I'm going to University of California, San Diego for this fall term. Um, I, settled in, I settled in PISB, uh, which is the International School of Bangalore. And I mainly did the International General Certificate of uh, Secondary Education, which is the IGCSC and the International Baccalaureate, which is the IBDP program. Um, currently, I've been admitted for mathematics and computer science, and I intend to do a, a secondary major in neurobiology or uh, bioinformatics. Um, during the college process, I applied uh, to multiple different uh, places in the United States and mainly Canada. Um, and my applications were divided into uh, three batches, which were my REACH colleges, my MATCH colleges, and my safeties. Uh, for my safeties, I mainly applied to the University of California, San Diego, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, University of Toronto, University of Waterloo, and University of British Columbia, all for mathematics and computer science. Uh, for my MATCH universities, I applied to uh, UCLA, uh, University of Michigan, Georgia Tech, and NYU. And for my REACH universities, I went very ambitious with my applications because, again, I wanted to try, uh, I wanted to reach as high as I could. Uh, so I applied to the University of Oxford in the UK, uh, Brown University, uh, U Chicago, Stanford, Princeton, Cornell, Duke, um, and some other universities, uh, just to name a few. Uh, Parth, you can also, uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Um, hey guys, I'm Parth. Uh, I am studying in Flame University at the moment. Uh, so until 10th grade, I was in ICSC uh, in Cambridge Public School. And for 11th and 12th, I was in ISC for, in Bethany Junior College. So as for the universities, I applied to around 12 universities and I got into six of them and also got waitlisted into two of them. So for my safeties, I applied to places like uh, Lawrence University, Carlton College, uh, and a couple of others. In my match universities, I applied to a uh, university, uh, sorry, Knox College, then um, University of uh, California, San Diego, UCLA, and uh, UC Davis. And uh, in, my, uh, in my REACH colleges, I applied to places like Stanford, Princeton, and Pomona. So out of those, I got accepted into a couple of colleges, uh, including uh, UC Davis, Knox College, uh, Cal State Long Beach, uh, no Knox College, wait, another couple of few, but yeah, basically. And uh, and the Fame University, which is in India. 
and I accepted Flame University's offer. So I'm here right now. Great. Uh, guys, do you want to mention any scholarship that you have received, if in case you have any, from any of the college offers? Uh, yeah, so uh, and then I got a I got an eighty percent scholarship from Knox uh, and Lawrence, and I got a seventy percent scholarship from Flame University in India, and I chose Flame's offer. Got it. Yeah, I only got my scholarships from the Canadian universities. Uh, so what, University of Waterloo, because I applied for the co-op program, they didn't actually um, allow for too much uh, money as a merit scholarship. So I only received a total of ten thousand. Canadian dollars per year, um, and uh, University of British Columbia was a similar offer as well as uh, University of Toronto. Got it. Great. Okay. With that, let me move on to the first segment, which is the test prep segment. And the first question in the test prep segment is: When did you really start preparing for your SAT, ACT? If in case you have given one, right? And uh, Path, why don't you go ahead first? Sure. So I started uh, pre preparing for my SAT, ACT back in sometime around Christmas 2019. And I really kicked it into gear in the summer of 2020. And I wrote my ACT exam at the end of summer during July. And I got a 35 on 36 there. Adwet? Yeah. So for the essay, I took the SATs and I, uh, did, I did them twice. The first time was in 2019, October. Uh, this time, I did not take the test too seriously. I only started prepping for it uh, a month in advance at Reviser. Um, and I also did take the classes beforehand, but I only started doing actual prep work one month in advance. Um, because of that and the lack of effort I put, I only did like a couple of papers. My score wasn't too great. So the second time around, which is around Mar um, in Jan 2020, uh, that's when I started putting a lot more effort. Uh, I started three months in advance before the test, and I started doing every single paper offered to me at Reviser. Um, and that did yield its results, leading, um, that did lead to some results, which led me to have 1520 in the SAT. Uh, do you guys, can you guys share any, uh, since you guys both did different tests, right? Uh, Part did ACT and you did SAT. So how did you arrive to whether you should do an SAT or an ACT? Like, were you very clear from day one? Uh, part uh, so honestly, I wasn't very clear on which area to go for. And uh, so we, what we did was uh, I did a bunch of uh, t prep tests, uh, mostly section-wise uh, practice. And I was able to see that I was performing much better on the ACT, especially in math sections compared to the SAT. Uh, although I would say that the reading sections were a bit trickier, I was able to manage them. So uh, because of that, I chose to do the ACT. And I think the, the whole decision-making process took around two to three months of uh, preparing before I arrived on the conclusion. Interesting. What about you, Adwa? Um, the ACT was a bit too fast-paced for me, though it didn't really make too much of a difference for the math section. For the English section, uh, that was a, ma a major uh, red flag for me, at least, because um, I always needed my time for English. Um, so... In the SAT, it was just you got more time for English, and with enough practice, you could uh, get through most of the papers within the time period. Got it. And how long it took you to decide between SAT and ACT? Um, I remember you got one diagnostic test, I guess. Yeah, it was rather quick. I think a diagnostic test, um, though I did better in the ACT, I realized my ceiling would be higher for the SAT, so I took the SAT instead. Right, right, right. Okay. Great, because that's generally one question, right? Where students are largely confused about whether they should do an SAT or an ACT. Any particular tips uh, for SAT or for ACT that you guys want to share with the students? Anything that worked for you? Uh, Pat, you can probably first. Oh, um, right. I, I, I'm trying to think about any specific tip. I would just say practice. And I think that applies even if it's SAT or ACT. You just need a lot of practice. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions, but once you start getting that, getting into that zone, you sort of realize that quite a lot of questions have the same structure, although they might differ in their content. So right. once you understand what the you know, question structure is, it's easier to attack those questions and get to the right answer faster. I'll just add two cents to that, right? Uh, I think Path is absolutely right in saying that practice, but I just add saying right practice. Right, right set of practice because you know you don't want to do papers which are not 
is really in line with the actual test. So you should try and do the tests which are in line with the actual exam because you know what you're doing with these, doing so many tests is you're trying to train your brain in such a way that you are trying to understand uh, why the examiner has put in this question, right? What are they trying to test you on? So you want to literally get into the psyche of the examiner there. Yeah, so more practice, but the practice should be more aligned towards the actual test. Uh, anything you want to share, Abhra? I was just saying, practice as much as you possibly can. I know it'll probably be a very painful process. You'll probably be a bit miserable over those three months of preparation. But after the test is done, it's a huge weight lifted off your shoulders and you actually learn a lot from it. Like personally, uh, the, the level of grammar I learned from the English section, the, my reading speed from prepping for the, uh, for the, again, the reading section in the test really did improve, uh, help me outside of the test also. And I didn't expect that going into the test. So they're all they're plus points and they're again, cons to the uh, writing the SAT, but something you just have to do. So you just have to try it and might as well give it your all. Actually, that's a very interesting point. Because, I mean, this is the first time I'm hearing that somebody actually came out and said that it actually helped them even later on, right? Because generally people say, hey, it's just a test and like afterwards I'm not going to use it. But when we actually think about it, you know, you have to write those essays. Right, and if you have actually done the grammar portion well in your SAT and if you learn those rules, you can actually apply all of them in your uh, the 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 lot of essays that you're gonna write for your colleges. So yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Great, I think with that, let me move on to the next question. And the next question is about uh, did you guys uh, take the AP exams? Uh, now, for the audience, let me quickly introduce what AP exams are. So AP stands for Advanced Placement Courses. Just like in India, we have IGCSE, IB, A-level, CBSE, ICSC, state boards, all these different boards. In US, uh, AP is a curriculum which is followed in different countries by a few schools. US doesn't have a fixed curriculum, but yeah, a few schools follow AP as a curriculum there. So why do people write AP exam? Uh, so you write it for various reasons. Right? So one of the reasons is you write it because you want to strengthen your college application. You want to showcase that you have done more than what your peers have. So apart from just doing the school courses, you would also take AP course to showcase your academic strength. That's one. Uh, the second reason why people write it because you also get credits, right? Which you don't, uh, in general, if you have done, let's say, CBSC and ICSC curriculum or ISC curriculum or state board, right? I know IB curriculum, you do get credits uh, for your HL subjects, but not for CBSC and ICSC. And hence, it's really important for them to do an AP course because you get credits while you're in India. And because that happens, you indirectly save cost. Because you know, in the US, you're paying for every credit that you're earning there, right? So you actually save cost. So these are different reasons why people write the AP exams. Uh, and uh, yeah, with that, let me move on to our speakers and ask them if in case they actually did any AP and what, is, what are their thoughts on the AP exams? Uh, Adrit, uh, over to you. Yeah, as mentioned before, I didn't do the uh, IB. Um, so I didn't really need to take the AP, so I didn't really take them, though I wish I took some in ninth and 10th grade. Um, but mainly the APs are not too difficult tests. They're not really difficult at all. Um, they're mainly just, um, I guess, um, at max, like 11th end portions or 12th portions. Uh, for most of the subjects, and they're very doable. Um, it's just with the course load, depending on your board, it may not be feasible to do it in 11th and 12th grade. But if you can, do it, give it a shot in like 10th grade or 9th grade. Uh, if that applies to you or not. Uh, as for me, uh, I didn't really do the AP and that's because I kind of started late. So I feel like if I had started the whole test prep a little earlier, I would have probably had the time to do an AP or two. And like Rajdeep sir said, it's, it is quite uh, helpful, not just to prepare you for college, but also to save costs. Because uh, like, you know, college is usually you know, treat credits very, very seriously and they are, they are very costly. So I feel like doing an AP in India is extremely helpful in sort of saving costs and preparing you for college. So you can, you can jump right into the core courses itself. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, great, so with that, uh, I think that those are the questions that we have from the test prep. Let me move on to the next section, which is the academics part. And you know, a lot of, students and some parents to come and say, hey, we got bad grades in ninth and 10th, and now we are in 11. Uh, do we still have a chance to go to a good college? Or uh, what else should we do to 
improve our profile and showcase that we are still doing well and we want to do well and we want to get into a good college, right? So what's your advice to those people? What should they be doing if they're in grade 11 and they have not been able to do well in grade 9 and 10? Do they still have a good chance? So uh, maybe Parth, you can take care. Uh, sure. So, um, so what I did for me, uh, my story is that I did okay in ninth and then I picked it up from 10th grade onwards. Uh, so if you have done poorly in your ninth and ninth and 10th, I really suggest that you, you know, kick it up a notch for your 11th and 12th. Cause even if you have done poorly in the past, as long as you can show that you have the potential and the ability to really study hard and have a dedication towards academics, you can probably send that message over to the academic counselor. Uh, even apart from that, I feel, uh, you know, it's, it's important that you participate in things other than just academic, like academic related, but not just in studies to show that, that level of dedication, perhaps, you know, some sort of research or uh, I think research is more on the STEM side. So Adwet will uh, talk about that. And yeah, in general, basically do that and uh, test prep in terms of SAT and ACT, you will have to really push your marks in order to show that. A small point I would like to make is if you have probably done poorly due to a specific reason, perhaps an extracurricular activity, which sort of ate away your time to study, it's a good idea to explain that. Uh, as for me, I'm a badminton player. I've been playing for the past 10 years and the reason I performed poorly-ish in ninth grade was because I was focused on playing badminton and I used to have around full day trainings. So uh, because of that, when I explained that in my, in my uh, profile, it makes sense to the academic counselor and it shows that you have so, uh, you know, sort of all-round ability where you're focused on academics, but you also uh, do extracurriculars, so that helps. Got it. Uh, over to you, Ajit. Yeah, so this is from my experience and seeing a lot of other a lot, a lot of my other peers during the application process. Um, generally, the consensus is that your ninth grade grades don't matter too much if you did uh, poorly. Um, but after that, from your tenth grade boards onwards, uh, grades matter a lot. So one thing to note is that in the application process in the U.S., fifty percent of your your entire application depends on your grades, and in Canada and the U.K., it's more like ninety to hundred percent. So grades do matter a lot. So in 11th and 12th, just you have to actually give all your complete effort into it because those grades are what you want to get you into the college or want to go, go to. Because your, the people you're competing with in the applications uh, have also worked really hard for this uh, spot. Um, so you're competing with them. So not necessarily the college which uh, looks for more grades, you have to choose which is the best applicant for that particular seat. And generally those applicants will have uh, top-notch grades. So you just do have to give it your all and you have to make sure your grades are uh, as best, best as they could be. In terms of what you could do on the extracurricular side, I'm mainly from a STEM background. Um, and one thing I've seen is that what adds a, a lot of value to your application is uh, your intention in that particular field, which I've seen mainly uh, through research. Because the most of the people who have gone to top universities, which I've seen, They've had really strong uh, research work in that particular field, especially in this in the raw sciences uh, like uh, biology, chemistry, and physics. Um, for computer science, it's mainly like showing intention that like going to hackathons, winning those hackathons, creating apps which actually have a purpose in society. Uh, like for example, uh, one possible app is like so like helping society in general. Like suppose you could just show an app, uh, have an app which could just point you towards the nearest hospital during an emergency. Um, those kind of apps really help. They don't have to be a huge app where like you have millions of users, just maybe a thousand or 2000 users. Those make a huge difference in your application. Cool. Interesting. Uh, just to add two cents, uh, basically I think that the order of priority should always be academics, uh, then the test prep and then the APs, right? So you have to make sure your, uh, your ACADs are sorted and then you move on to your test prep and then you move on to the APs, right? So if the first two things are not sorted, don't even think about writing an AP. If the first two are sorted, then write about, uh, think about writing the APs and so on, right? So, so all these things are related to each other, but, uh, but your academics is, is given, right? So in colleges, they assume that that's great. And then you are applying and you're looking at other factors, right? So try, I mean, if you don't have it right now, I mean, you can't do much about it. Obviously you can compensate it by doing better in the test prep and 
taking few AP courses. But yeah, try and make sure that you are showing an upward trend. You know, uh, I've heard from like last weekend, we had different speakers and last last weekend, and they all said that one thing which was common was uh, US loves to see that upward trend, right? They want to see you improving, right? So that when you actually go to the college, you are you are in that trajectory of doing better. However, some people will question and say that, hey, we couldn't do well in grade 9th and 11th because of the curriculum that we are in, right? CBSC and ICC generally are difficult in grade 9th and 11th. So you will see a dip. But you know, the admission counselors who are sitting there, admission officers who are sitting there, they understand each and every curriculum really well, right? So, so they know that there is a dip. Uh, they get hundreds and thousands of application every year from Indian candidates. So they know how the CBSC, ICSC, and its state board curriculum works, right? So don't be worried about, hey, my grades drop in grade 11 because my school in particular gives very difficult tests and uh, the scaling is, scoring is difficult. So uh, whereas on the other school, uh, the scaling is very good and blah, blah, blah. You know, don't get into those mindset. I see students talking about that a lot more and make it a big issue. You know, colleges are smart enough. They counsel, the admission officers are smart enough to figure all of that out. Yeah, because they also need a pool which is very... Uh, like a mixed pool, right? So they don't want everybody from the same curriculum or from the same school or from the same city for that matter or from the same country, right? So they want people from different geography as well. Yeah. Great, with that, let me move on to the next question, which is a bit philosophical in nature, but I generally try and keep this question just to understand how these, uh, I mean, how our speakers thought process have changed. So uh, what people think colleges want versus what colleges actually want. Right, so um, over to you, Adwet, first. Yeah, so I think most of you already know this, but colleges do look for a particular, they do have like a certain kind, like checklist you should just do. Like you want something uh, to do with community service, something to do with your school spirit, and something to do with your, um, your actual subject you're actually interested in. Um, and one thing they also want you to show is that you, want, you have to be like uh, very, uh, you have to show a lot of incentive about your own subject. You have to show a lot, and you have to be exceptional at that, or exceptional one or two things. You have to show a lot, a lot of work. You've actually put a lot of effort into uh, what you want to do in the future, and maybe some other effort. How you could uh, tie that in creatively through community service, or tie that in creatively through your school. Um, and one thing I, I guess, which I missed out in my application was uh, the importance of your accolades. So for my application, I did not have too many accolades. Uh, but those accolades really make a difference in the application. Um, like, for example, going to these Olympiads, um, you can go to the IMO, you can go to the AMC, you can go to the International Finance Olympiad. Uh, just participating in them and coming to like, num like in the top three positions in your school or even qualifying for the further levels, uh, those make a huge difference in your application. If you're an American citizen, taking the PSAT is also a very important thing because you do get uh, options for a, a scholarship. Though the scholarship doesn't matter too much, uh, um, when you're actually applying, if you qualify as a semi-finalist or a finalist, those really give you a lot of uh, bonus points when the application process comes or when they're looking at your application. Another also important thing is just participating in school, just doing anything you can. Um, as long as you have some award to show for it, it does really help your application a lot. Over to you, Pat. Uh, honestly, I feel like Adwell has covered most of it. And uh, like, yeah, like, I, like, you know, most people know now these days that colleges look for sort of an all, like I said before, an all round, uh, an all rounded person. So you can't just be into academics, even if you are into academics, you need to make sure that you have extracurriculars related to those areas. So you show your interest. Uh, but one uh, important point that I've seen uh, over the past couple of uh, years and months is that you know, you cannot just dabble into a few little things and show that that's your interest. Because even if you're doing it in terms of your application, you know, to show it on your application, you need to make sure that you're actually giving it your all in, in whatever area that you're looking into. So, for instance, let's say you're a humanities student and you're particularly interested in some sort of research. So there's no point in doing five different researches across one month and just somehow putting it out there. Rather, if you can do one proper in-depth research, that makes more sense. And uh, along with that, uh, you know, I, from what I feel, it's, it's a good idea to show what long-term dedication you have. Uh, so for me, I, like I said, I play badminton and I didn't really do this for the application. I did it because it was one of my passions. 
And since I've done it for such a long time, I can not only show that I have extracurricular abilities apart from academics, I can also show that I have a dedication and I have the ability to, you know, patiently stay in a specific area or field for a long duration. So I feel like, uh, you know, college counselors or, you know, people looking into your application will actually appreciate that. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's one thing I feel that's often missed. Got it. Great. Uh, I think with that, we move on from academics and we'll start looking at the application process in itself. And I think one of the questions that I keep hearing uh, from parents from the student is, uh, I'm not a US citizen, right? So do I still have the same chance as my peers who are a US citizen and applying from India? Uh, or will I be at a disadvantage? So especially with regards to the admission, right? So um, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, 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 yeah, so what I feel is there's pros and cons. Um, let me start with the cons first. I feel like it will be a bit trickier for one to get uh, admission into a college in USA if you're not a US citizen. Of course, it's not that much of a difference. Um, you can definitely get into a prestigious college no matter which country you're from. But, uh, you know, the thing is, it, they, usually people are put into pools. So Indian citizens would be pool pulled into some sort of maybe an India pool or maybe an Asia pool. And uh, from, you know, usually these countries are extremely competitive academically. So, uh, you know, even if you, you're not really competing with American students, usually you're comp competing with students of your own area and that competition is pretty high. So that's, that's a sort of disadvantage. Uh, but on the pro side, what I see is usually Indian curriculum is pretty strong when it comes to academics and it's pretty strict about this. So uh, the amount of effort you have to put in to reach a high level is relatively lesser compared to possibly American students. Uh, so yeah, I feel like that's a pro in, in terms of getting, app, getting a good application made or getting good test score made. What do you admit? Um, so being an Indian citizen, it does hinder you a bit, but not by a significant margin. Um, I think in one area where it might hinder you a lot is when you're applying to public universities apart from the UCs. Um, because in the US, generally, the public colleges, they prefer having in-state students. Um, I think the most notable will be like the Texas universities, uh, the U University of Texas, like at Austin and Dallas. Uh, because Texas has a rule where any in-state uh, resident uh, has a right to attend any of their UTs uh, if they meet a certain grade threshold, which is not very high. Um, so over there, they generally take a lot of their intake from their, uh, from their own state, around 90 to 95%. Um, similar for other top public universities like the University of Michigan, Georgia Tech, and University of Virginia. The UCs are a bit different where they do take a lot of international students. I think their, um, their intake is very high, close to like 30% international students, which is very uh, like probably the highest in the country. Uh, but for like the public universities, the top IVs, and all of those, um, I think uh, uh, the university which everyone wants to go to, they don't make much of a difference. The only problem is that again, you'll be put into pools because the universities, they want all students, they don't want all students to be from a the same demographic. Um, so they want different people from different backgrounds, people uh, from urban backgrounds, people from suburban backgrounds, people from different countries. So they have a lot of diversity in their uh, batch. So because of that, they generally pool in um, all the Asians together uh, because again, they only want all of them. They want us to put everyone from a particular background. So you're not really competing with everyone as a whole in the application board. You're competing with your peers uh, in your school. You're competing with everyone in the country. Um, and that's what makes it a bit more trickier because people from India generally have a lot, have a very strong application compared to other countries. Got it. Okay. Great. With that, let me move on to the next question. And that's again, very common doubt, especially students in grade nine, 10, and sometime in early 11th as well. Well, I don't know which subject I wish to study in college, right? Uh, will that going to affect my admission, uh, be it US, UK, or Canada, right? So do you guys think that going in as an undecided major, and in case you're not very clear about your major, uh, is there a disadvantage to it? Should one be very clear about what they want to do and then apply? Or is it okay to apply as undecided? Uh, maybe let's start with Advet and maybe Advet, you can talk about different geographies since you applied to two, two three different geographies that you probably would know about. Them. Yeah. 
So for the UK in particular, you have to be pretty certain about what you want to do because they don't really allow switching your um, or your major or whatever you want to study in between. You have to go with it for like three to four years, generally three years. Um, in Canada and the US, it's still it's a very free uh, system where you can choose whatever you want to do over time. The only thing I would work, caution you about is that uh, if you want to plan to do engineering or computer science in particular, in most universities, those are capped majors or they're completely blocked for you to switch into. Um, the blocked ones are very rare. I think it's only like one or two, but generally they're capped and it's very difficult to switch into the computer science or engineering schools. The other majors, it makes no difference. You can switch very easily, but there are case by case basis where you cannot do that at all. For example, would be Johns Hopkins where uh, if you want to do biology and you're not admitted for biology, it's very difficult to switch into biology because that is the best school in the country. Uh, but other schools, it's pretty simple to switch into whatever subject you want. Right. Uh, Pat, over to you. Uh, yeah, so since I've applied mainly to US colleges, I would know more about those. And uh, what I can tell you is, so the US system sort of encourages you to explore uh, in fact, first years usually are allowed to take courses in multiple disciplines in order to understand where their interests lie. And uh, so I feel like it's not, a, it, it's not a big danger for you to say that you're not sure what you want to study. Uh, but from what I, what I feel is it's a good idea to at least have a general idea of what you want to do. So in case maybe you're absolutely sure you're going to do something in humanities, you're not sure whether it's going to be political science, sociology, economics, etc. But as long as you know which general area you're, you're going into, it's a good idea to show that to the uh, admission officer uh, because that sort of gives them the confidence that you're slightly sure about yourself. You're not completely lost. And uh, that, that just puts a better picture than saying I'm completely lost because that's usually not the case. You usually know where your interests lie in, in a sort of general picture. Okay, got it. Uh Okay, with that, let me move on to the next question. Uh, that you know, we talk a lot about rankings and all of that, and especially in India. So, uh, should one give preference to the college ranking, or should they talk about largely the major that you want to do, or the course scholarship that you get right while you're deciding your college? So, what are the options that you should be dis like? What are the things that you should be considering, or what you have considered, right, and how you have eliminated and you have reached to a particular university? Uh, let's start with Advait here. The first most important thing which everyone should consider is the cost. Because to going to a foreign country, the, the expense for the education is uh, very hefty. So that is something you have to consider as a primary. Um, and then I think the secondary should be the college you're going to apply to and the ranking and the reputation of the college in your particular major itself. Um, um, the general rankings that you find online about the uh, entire universities also based on the university's performance in every single category. Um, so some colleges may not even appear. Um, and this is because in the US, again, most students don't really know what they want to do. Um, so going to a college which is good at everything is generally a safe bet. So you can switch into whatever you want and you'll still be fine. Um, but in reality, if you know roughly where you want to go, if you would roughly in which field you want to be in, for example, if it's the humanities or something roughly it's in the STEM field and particularly which subject also, you can choose a university which is very good in that field and you could pro it'll probably be the best option for you. But you do have to factor in other factors also, uh, which is like this, your, I think your standard of living in that particular college, the social life, the weather, and don't underestimate how much weather will play into your mood um, and the location of your college itself. Got it. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'll, so what my personal experience is, uh, I made a mistake in that sort of uh, factoring in and seeing what my priorities are. I focused main on what the strength of the college is and, you know, what's like, for example, I'm interested in economics. So I was looking into like, colleges that are strong in economics without giving too much of a thought on how much scholarship they allow or uh, how willing they are to take in students from international areas. And um, I feel like that's one of the most important things that you need to look, because it's, again, end of the day, it comes down to how much budget you have set for your college education and whether or not the college fulfills that budget. So it's very important to look into that. And once you're done with that, you can look into the priorities, just like Advait said, 
uh and i think he covered most of the points one last thing i feel like is is an important point you need to understand what you're trying to do you know in college apart from studying so uh, as for me i'm interested in, in doing some sort of research so it would be a good idea for me to search and you know find a college which is close to good internship opportunities or which provides a lot of research opportunities so um let's say i let for example nyu it's it's very much in the city so i know i can possibly do an intern like a proper internship part time internship and study like the major at the same time so i think it's important to know what your priorities are in that way and then find a location of the college right makes sense makes sense uh great that i think uh, with that let me move on to the last question for today and that's largely about the the college essay right that everyone is always worried about uh, when should we start writing the college essay what's the right time and how important are they right uh, and maybe if you can walk through your journey in terms of any essays you you wrote and when did you start and so on and maybe let's start with adwait first um yeah so again i applied to the us but the essay is a well, there are like a quite a few essays you have to write um so i applied to i think a total of 50 in the us um, i think i might it might be more i'm not too certain right now uh but uh generally i started very early with the essays so uh, in the us there are two rounds of applications your early applications and your regular applications so your early applications go have to be submitted and sent to the universities um towards the end of september or say the beginning of september um so beginning of september starts in january by the end of the beginning of november it ends um different calls have different deadlines so i would suggest you start doing your essays around the same time i did which is in around june or july just give it a start writing just write whatever thoughts you have about what you want to write because it does take quite a bit of time to brainstorm a good essay and it does take quite a bit of time to draft uh, those essays into a, a presentable idea or a present like a presentable quality um so uh though just take your time over the main essay like a common application essay your other as the coalition application essay i didn't really use the coalition application but the common application essay does it's the first thing they see when you when you when they open up the common app so it's something which uh is a very important part of your application probably the most important which is then followed by the call specific essay so be very careful to which universities you apply to because some of them they have very quirky essays one of them which is notorious for this is the university of chicago they have this one essay which is a thousand word essay where about some very weird topics which is very fun to write but it does take a lot of your time so different colleges have weird different essays so make sure you are certain that you can write these essays uh, before applying or just give it your best shot uh i think over time after you apply to like 10 to 15 you you start realizing there's some things you can reuse so you do end up reusing essays because towards the end it does become very very tedious to write them um and you really don't want to write them anymore um so again it's fine doing that but make sure you again uh write them very well because the app the essays itself they have like a not a ma- massive weight uh, for your application but they do have a very important part they do play an important role in your application i would say around 20% of your application is based on your essays on to your part uh yeah so you know from you know when i talked to a couple of my seniors what i found out was basically the essay is the only way usually the only way that uh, the admission counselor no, can understand you as a person because they haven't really met you and you know marks and accolades that that just comes in the form of text so the, the only way they can truly understand you is through your essays and that's why it's so important and uh yeah you know it, it's people usually tend to underestimate how many essays you need to write so i i applied to only 12 colleges and i ended up writing around 50ish essays so that's a lot of content although like adwait said there's some parts you can reuse and uh, yeah i feel like again you need you can as you know the earlier you start the better it is of course you don't you shouldn't start like 2 years ahead i don't think that's that you know that's a bit too much because i feel like you usually write about your experiences and as you grow you experience better but i think around 4 4 to 5 months uh, in advance before the early uh, application uh, window opens seems to be a good idea and uh, i feel like one small advice i would like to give is that of course you know you're supposed to 
show your essays to perhaps your parents or teachers, someone who can help you refine them and give it out in the best form that they are. Uh, but, you know, end of the day, you need to make sure that while they might make minor changes to the, uh, to the essay itself, the foundation, the core content should remain unchanged because that's who you really are. So if you end up changing too much or that's just, you know, that's just showcasing someone else or it just looks very fake and college counselors don't want that. They want the real you. Uh, so keep it as raw as you can, even if you want to, you know, refine it. Got it. Uh, so I think in the last uh, webinar, last Saturday, like one of the students said this line and I really loved it. So I'll probably use it this time as well. He said, you know, your essay should be such that uh, let's say if you lose your essay in class and someone else in your class pick, picks it up and there's no name written over it, we should be able to come and give it to you say, hey, I think your essay is here. Do you want to keep it back? Right? So that essay should describe you in such a way that anybody around you should be able to figure out, hey, this essay actually belongs to Adveda, this essay belongs to Park, without even having a name on top of it, right? So if, if that's happening, that means you are able to portray yourself in the right form, right? Uh, so I think that's one thing which I really loved, and I think I will probably keep using that time and again. Uh, and uh, as uh, Path rightly said, and uh, even the other uh, people have said the same thing, you know, Yes, it's good to show it to multiple people, but you know, you should fix that number, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four, and don't take opinions from 10 different people because that's gonna confuse you a lot more than it's gonna help you. And you know, by the end of it, you'll get frustrated with it, right? And you might actually lose the base of your essay and the essay might just represent something else, right? So I think that's a, that's a very, very valid point. Uh, uh, I know this is what we wanted to take, but I'll add one more question because I know there are few parents here who probably would want to understand the process since since uh, Path is going to Flame University. Uh, Path, do you want to talk about the process of Flame? Like what all steps did you go through? What tests, uh, essays or anything? Uh, if you can explain the Flame University process as well, specifically. Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, if you have applied to foreign universities, honestly, Flame has more or less the same system. Uh, you need to write a couple of essays. Uh, they, they, surprisingly, despite being an Indian university, they have a lot of foreign standards, which is why they accept uh, SAT and ACT test scores. And even if you haven't written that, they have their own uh, sort of SAT exam. So it's based on the SAT exam, but they've sort of modified it to their own university. Uh, but honestly, they're completely fine with SAT and ACT scores. And uh, from what I've seen, honestly, they value academics a lot more uh, but they are into extracurriculars, especially their whole, mo they are, they're a liberal arts college. So they are, they are very much into you doing multiple things and not just focusing on just your studies. So as long as you can portray yourself to be an all rounder, as, you, as long as you show that you have multiple interests and you go deep into all of them, uh, you're, you're absolutely fine. I think there's a problem with Rajdeep Sir's internet. Um, can we just wait for him for like two minutes? If... Sure. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Adwar, is there something perhaps you want to add that you couldn't during this session? Um, I think I did cover whatever I wanted to say. Um, it's just, uh, again, at the end of the day, which college you go to doesn't really make too much of a difference. Uh, but it matters what you do at the college. So, uh, with all the colleges, if you're applying to the U.S., all of them do have a lot of opportunities. So you have to make full use of every resource you have, even at school. Make use of every resource you have, uh, because at the end of the day, um, uh, those small things, the amount of effort you put every day, even working like two hours, three hours every single day, is probably what will make a huge difference than cramming last minute before a test. Also, that will also uh, set a better work ethic for you uh, over time. Uh, because I think right now, if you start with two or three hours, over time, it'll become like seven to eight hours a day. You'll just be working and working. And over time, it won't feel tedious to work. It'll just be natural for you. And you actually you start like doing it. I think that's one suggestion I would uh, probably have for most people. Start getting into a rhythm of working every day. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess with that, we are at the end of the session and I'll open the forum for Q and A's. If in case there are questions, guys, uh, please put it on the chat section. Uh, I will allow you guys to unmute yourself as well. So if in case you want to ask it directly, please go ahead and put that as well. Uh, so I'll open the forum for questions now. So it could be anything related to the college. Uh, we also have somebody from the Indian college who is going to India college. So I think you can discuss about that. If in case there is any, we'll wait for another minute before we close off in, in case there are no more questions. Uh, till the time, I think uh, I probably have one more question, but uh, if you can answer. So do you think, uh, is it okay to submit the SETST scores? Uh, would you be at a disadvantage if you are applying to Flame, Ashoka, these Indian universities? Would you be okay with the SETST scores? Or do you think uh, people who are writing their exam would be at an advantage? Um, actually, I think as long as you have, if you, as long as you have a good SAT, ACT score, it's completely fine to, uh, you know, send those to the college. Uh, okay. I mean, first of all, because you've already done the work and you have proof for it. So you don't really need to do another test for that. Uh, right. second is that test is basically based on the same, you know, test that you already wrote. Uh, third yeah. being, uh, since they are like, at least I know about flame, uh, because, you know, I've applied there, but they, they, they're very much, you know, although they're Indian universities, they're kind of very much into foreign standards, like I said before. So uh, I didn't really apply for any scholarship. There wasn't much of an option, uh, but I was, I was lucky enough to be one of the handful few that got chosen for a scholarship automatically. And that was me without having done any sort of, uh, you know, their own test. And I actually applied a bit late compared to, the, compared to when the window for application opens up. So I feel like as long as you have a good score and as long as you have a good application, you're absolutely set. So there's no problem with that. Got it. Uh, great. I think uh, with that, I would like to close the webinar. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Pat and Adbert for taking time uh, before you guys are off to the college. I'm sure it's going to be really, really helpful for all the, uh, I think all the participants out here. We're going to put it on the YouTube channel as well uh, for the people and share this link among other students. I know the attendance was not great. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, the SET is happening right now as we, uh, as we speak. And hence, uh, there are a lot of students who are attending the SET and the parents have gone to drop them off to the school. And hence, uh, because of that. So, But I have already had a lot of requests from the parents asking for the YouTube link. So we're going to share that. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks again, Path. Thanks again, Adred, for taking time and making this possible. Yeah, thank you for inviting us. It's a really thank pleasure. you. Pleasure, pleasure, guys. Thank you. Bye, bye. Have a nice day. Bye. bye.